It's a tremendous blessing to be able to interview today Father Maximus Constus. Father Maximus, welcome to St. Andrew Church. We are in the 40-day, the sacred 40-day period after the repose of the highly esteemed and deeply respected elder of Mount Athos, Father Emilianos, the one-time abbot of the Holy Monastery of Simenopetra, who fell asleep in the Lord on the ninth of this month, on the feast day of the uh, great martyr Christopher and the holy prophet Isaiah. Father Emilianos has had a tremendous edifying influence on Orthodox Christians and many beyond the church throughout the whole world uh, on my life and many of my fellow priests' lives, and I know especially on your life, Father Maximus. Most of our uh, viewers of this interview will know you well, but for the sake of some who might, I'd like to make just a small introduction of Father Maximus. Father Maximus is a priest and archimandrite of the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese uh, here in America. He is a, an esteemed patristic scholar uh, and resides at uh, next to Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology in Boston, where he has taught for years. And this is after a distinguished career as a professor of theology at Harvard Divinity School. He is also a tonsured monk of the monastery of Simenopetra on Mount Athos, where he spent many years as a monk. We are in great debt to you, Father, for the gargantuan labor of translating um, so many of the works of Father Emilianos into the English language, as well as your incredible work translating St. Maximus the Confessor. Uh, really, we're in your debt. We're tremendously in your debt. And I thank you for entertaining this uh, brief interview on the life and influential teachings of Elder Emilianos. Would you share with us, Father, a little bit about uh, the life of Father Emilianos and, and help us have a sense of his own personal biography? Sure, I'd be happy to. I mean, <clears throat> I suppose the first thought that comes to mind is that it's really difficult to take the measure of a man's life. I mean, and that's true, I think, even for what we might call an ordinary human life, or how much more difficult in the case of someone like this, who mm. is just an outstanding sort of towering figure who did so much amazing work and influenced so many people. I think it'll be a long time and a blessed long time before we, as we continue to come to terms with uh, just the elder and his uh, contribution. I mean, he was born in the 1930s and uh, entered monastic life in the 60s and very quickly attracted uh, a very devoted circle of uh, students and disciples around him who ended up becoming monks and nuns in monasteries that he established. I think around 1973, uh, his brotherhood moved from Meteora in central Greece to the monastery of Simenopetra while the nuns were established in the convent of uh, Ormelia, which as many people know is one of the more outstanding uh, monastic houses in uh, Greece with well over uh, 100 uh, nuns and committed to all kinds of really uh, just great mm -hmm. uh, work. And uh, I suppose around 1995, the elder began to show signs of an illness that would eventually require him to retire. And in uh, 2000, he was replaced by the current abbot, uh, Elder Eliseos, which is the Greek way of saying Elisha. And Elisha, of course, was the disciple and successor of the prophet Elijah. So we do have this nice continuity between Beautiful. the elder and his successor, uh, uh, Elder Eliseos. How is it that Americans like myself could be familiar with Elder Emilianos? How is it that a, a man who's retired to the monastery, so to speak, could have such a profound influence on contemporary orthodoxy? Well, it's sort of like, it's sort of like the way in which icons don't have walls or ceilings on them. I mean, events that took place indoors are not boxed in mm. inside of houses. They're depicted as having taken place outside. I think something similar 
happened here. I mean, the, the, the grace that this man bore and the energy that God uh, gave him and just the, 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 the torrent of sort of divine speech that poured forth from his lips was something that could not be contained within the confines of uh, the monastery. And uh, it's also the case, of course, that he uh, was just this extraordinary speaker, I mean, a mesmerizing speaker with this sort of large eyes and very expressive features with an incredible command of the language and of uh, rhetoric. And uh, while he wrote very little, uh, he spoke uh, quite prolifically. And the monastery archive has a series of recordings of his talks that number around 3,000. Incredible. 3,000 talks, which means he was giving about 100 or so formal or semi-formal talks for a period of every year for 30 years. Incredible. So through his preaching in Greece and Cyprus and uh, later on through the, the transcription and publication of his works, he has become increasingly known to a, a larger public. What was his pedagogical schedule? Did he have fixed days on which he would deliver talks? How do you deliver a hundred substantial talks every year for 30 years? Well, I, I mean, you don't. I mean, it's, it's really a remarkable thing. I think, again, we're talking about somebody who, who was really on fire with God and his strength and abilities and powers as a speaker and as a, a pastor and as a monastic leader, they just go beyond, I mean, anything that we, can, we could consider to be sort of normal or uh, ordinary. But as far as your question goes, there's sort of, most of it followed the typical monastic routine. I mean, the, the elder was a born teacher. I mean, he was a born, he, he was gifted. He was gifted with the gift of speech. And as in many, mona many monastic sort of traditions or orders, he would speak to the community on uh, Sundays in the refectory or later on in the afternoon, or always great feast days or on the days where vigils were celebrated, later on in that day after a rest was taken. These were always opportunities for, uh, really for teaching. I mean, it's, it's a catechism in a sense. It's an ongoing education of the brotherhood. It's an ongoing initiation, not simply into monastic life, but an ongoing initiation into the life of the church, which, is, which means into the life of Christ. So. Am I right to think, Father, that he also <clears throat> left the monastery in order to missionize and to preach and, and interact with lay people? It seems that in, in the reading that I've done of him, he also speaks about many very contemporary, relevant themes to in the lives of lay people. Well, uh, there's not a whole lot of reason to leave a place when 10 and 20,000 visitors a year go to that place. Sure. So he did, he did leave the Holy Mountain uh, uh, in response to invitations from local hierarchs throughout Greece, and he would travel, not Greece is a small country, he would travel to different cities and maybe sometimes give two or three talks mm -hmm. in the same city, sometimes on the same day while he uh, was there. Uh, all, the same, uh, he was also beloved by people in Cyprus and uh, undertook trips there as well. So yeah, through visitors at the monastery and his own sort of presence in the Church of Greece and elsewhere, he became known to many people. I've heard also that he played a fundamental role in the rejuvenation of Athenite monasticism uh, in the 20th century. Is that accurate? It is. This is, this is really just a fascinating uh, phenomenon. And a number of very good things have been uh, written about it, but uh, in broad brushstrokes, I mean, around the early 1960s, the, popul the monastic population of Manathos appeared to be at an all-time low. Mm. Most of the monasteries were uh, had only a small number of very old uh, monks, and there were no new novices uh, on the horizon. And I think in, I, I don't remember the year exactly, 1961 maybe, or 62, 61, there was the 1,000 year anniversary of Mount Athos. That was the 1,000 year anniversary of the establishment of the great Lavra, which was the first Cenobitic monastery established there. And this was a huge celebration. The king of Greece was there, hmm. Orthodox patriarchs were there, heads of Orthodox 
states were there. And the inside joke among the participants was that they had come, in fact, to, cel to celebrate the funeral Incredible. of Mount Athos. To bid farewell. To bid farewell. And right around that same time, the first uh, novice showed up after none had shown up in a very long time. So things began to change, right? Or, in other words, at this sort of nadir mm -hmm. in the history of the mountain, things unexpectedly uh, turned around because the Greek state had been planning to move all of the remaining monks into one monastery and turn the rest of the monastery, the rest of the peninsula, the rest of Mount Athos into a tourist uh, destination. And the only thing that prevented them from doing it in a timely manner was the sheer logistics of securing and uh, guarding a, a place of that size. That never happened, and in the meantime, new monks began to show up. So, Amongst he, which were Father Emilianos about 10 years after that, you said, in the mid early, early 70s? Right, it's, it's, really, it's really a very, very interesting sort of phenomenon, and I mean, it gives witness to the activity of God in his church and sort of the spirit moving within history, because we, we essentially had two sources from which the holy mountain was rejuvenated or repopulated. Uh, an internal source and an external source. I mean, the most important internal source were the disciples of Elder Joseph uh, the Hesychast, who became abbots of multiple monasteries and attracted new young monks to those monasteries. Uh, among the abbots who came from outside of the mountain are people like Elder Emilianos, Elder Alexios of Xenofondos, Elder George of Grigoriu. So we, again, we had a new life sort of emerging within uh, the mountain and new life coming from outside of the mountain, the two coming together to create this phenomenon, a kind of renaissance in a sense of yes. life on the holy mountain. <clears throat> the writings, the, the teachings of Father Emilianos are so saturated with Holy Scripture. His insight, especially to the Old Testament, um, his devotion to the Psalms uh, drips from the, the, the pages of the stenographers who wrote down, or if he, I don't know if he wrote them or himself or not, of his text. But what was, <coughs> am I right to think that there is a special connection that he had with the Psalter and that he actually was able to pass on to the monastery and to the world? Yeah, the elder was, I mean, a deeply learned man. I mean, he had uh, a degree in theology from the University of Athens, but beyond that, he was a devoted uh, reader and spent much of his time I mean, studying the writings of the fathers of the church, Byzantine monastic foundation documents, and everything that was relevant to the life of the monastery was something that he read and often uh, commented on. I mean, among his beloved books, in a sense, was the Old Testament. He had a very special and a very deep devotion to the Old Testament. <clears throat> Part of that can be seen in uh, one of his works, which is available in English, and it's his commentary on a number of select uh, psalms, which I consider to be a sort of masterpiece of orthodox spiritual exegesis. I mean, on the one hand, they're informed by let's say the best of the historical critical tradition because he was aware of that level of literature but his, but his audience of course is a monastic audience and the aim is to edify and to inspire and his, his, his interpretation, his exegesis of these psalms it really has to be read to be uh, appreciated. There's really nothing quite uh, like it. Also related to his interest in the Old Testament was the revival of the singing of the psalms in the monastic uh, mm -hmm. liturgy. Mm -hmm. I mean, ancient monks spend most of their time reciting the Psalter. And the Psalter is still read once a week in its entirety in a monastery that's able to do that. <clears throat> but they were no longer sung. And through the very talented chanters that were in the monastery, the elder encouraged the revival of psalm singing. So one of the musical books that the monastery has published is a very large collection of psalms that are set to music. And some of these, I mean, most people are familiar with the hymn to the Virgin, the Agni Parthene, but uh, the psalms also uh, deserve to be 
uh, better known. Some of them have been translated into English and they've been being sung in different places, but yeah. Could you share with us a bit about <coughs> his uh, lectures on the Psalms? Because you, in fact, made the English translation yourself of that book. Would you tell us about particularly that book and other <coughs> books that you've translated of Elder Emilianos' work so that our readers, our English readers, would have an avenue to explore him more? Yeah, I, I, I mean, it, it would be very hard to pick a, a favorite work of his, but certainly the commentary on the Psalms is, would be high on the list. I mean, if you, if you didn't think the Psalms were relevant to you, if you thought the Psalms were somehow archaic or stilted or just lacked life or, uh, uh, well, then th you should buy a copy of this book and, and sit down and read it because he really makes these Psalms come alive. And uh, this is one of the things that helped me to reappreciate really the, the power of the Psalter, which has always been the prayer book of the church. Sure. Right? But uh, sometimes you need a little help in, in realizing that. So, you know, people say it's, it's a bit of a cliche and not entirely true. But they say that in the rest of the Bible, God speaks to man. But in the Psalter, man mm -hmm. speaks to God, which is why it was this prayer book of the church, because the whole range of human emotion and feeling is, is present there in the Psalter. Praise, thanksgiving, glorification, confession, sorrow, lament, mm -hmm. pain, fear, anxiety, stress, suffering, it's all there. So, uh, this, which is why it's been, as I said, the, the sort of the prayer book of the church. And uh, maybe, maybe one of the more significant things that stands out is what we might call the sort of theology of suffering or illness that the elder articulates in these commentaries on uh, the Psalms. Uh, and he basically argues that <clears throat> the pain that we experience and the suffering that we experience in life, whether it's psychological or especially physical, because the psalmist often speaks about you know, physical illnesses and, ail and ailments. His argument is that this pain is not so much my pain, but it's the pain of God who is seeking to find me. Hmm. But that sounds a little odd at first, but he uses an image to illustrate it. And he says that, imagine God as a great runner who has been racing to catch up with me my whole life. And he's been running so long and running so hard to catch up with me that his limbs ache and his muscles are sore and he's parched and he goes, and you know how painful that can be when you're completely dehydrated. God, as, if, as, as it were, has somehow exhausted himself trying to find me before I go over the edge, go over the abyss. And so the pain that I feel it's not my pain, but it's the pain of God who is seeking mm. to find me and who has been seeking to find me since all eternity. And to this he adds a beautiful image from St. Gregory the theologian, <coughs> excuse me, who says that God thirsts to be thirsted for. In other words, God desires to be desired. But the word thirsts, of course, is the same word that Christ uses on the cross when he says that I thirst. So his thirst for us, his desire for us, his love for us is so great that these are the lengths that the cross, death on the cross is the length that he's willing to go to for the sake of that love. Mm -hmm. And that's how he understands pain and suffering. I mean, I've never seen anything actually quite like this. And I've always thought it was very striking, How How but beautiful. also very beautiful and also very helpful in moments of difficulty and Absolutely. sort of the biblical idea that God comes to you in that dark cloud. Mm. So. You've just uh, released uh, a new text through New Rome <coughs> Press, which is your translation of Elder Emilianos' uh, lectures on the spiritual life according to St. Maximus the Confessor. It's a beautiful book, very well done by the press. Could you tell us just a little bit about this book and <clears throat> would you suggest this to uh, an, a believer who wants to get to know uh, both the Elder and St. Maximus? This is actually a good example of uh, some of the work that the Elder did in the monastery. 
he would read and study various texts by spiritual and ascetic writers, and then he would offer a commentary on them to the monks. And these would typically unfold over a period of weeks or sometimes even longer, where he would just give one talk at a time, and over the course of uh, several days or months, as I said, uh, a commentary would uh, emerge. So, for example, he has a fantastic commentary on Ezekias of Sinai, who appears in the first volume of the Philokalia, on Abba Isaiah and other spiritual and ascetic writers. Hmm. This, these, the, the chapters in this book are his talks, his sort of on running commentary on select passages from St. Maximus the Confessor's uh, chapters on love. And he must have selected these excerpts very, because there are 400 chapters, and sure. he doesn't comment on all of them comments on a small number, but he must have obviously chose them very well and very wisely because he manages to use this commentary to offer a kind of, I think, just consummate introduction to the Orthodox uh, spiritual tradition. And he does it in a way that's very simple and straightforward and effective, and it's not sort of expository or academic or intellectual, but it's much more sort of experiential. And most people who have read the book tell me that they they find it very, I mean, convicting is the word that many people use. It just sort of grabs them by their lapels yeah. and, you know, shakes them up a bit and opens their eyes to kind of uh, the spiritual life and their relationship to God. I did find it that way myself. I felt that he was standing right in front of me and uh, discombobulating me in order to reassemble me is how I felt very engaging uh, at a, in, the, in the interior. Elder Emilianos just amazes me. I'm a married priest, have children and grandchildren, and yet I, when I read him about matters that I think most would assume a monk would not be an expert on, I just am flabbergasted. I have two particular um, teachings that he's given that have deeply impressed me and has just left me uh, nonplussed. How, how could this be? His incredible uh, teaching on marriage, the great sacrament, right. and his uh, fascinating um, small article on technology, which was so prophetic and so timely at a time that at that time, I think in the early 80s when he wrote it or spoke it, uh, but even more so applicable today. How is it, how is it that Father Emilio Nos could see so penetratingly and offer such incredible practical guidance for people living in the married state, for people working with technology, though a monk? Yeah, you're right, you're right to emphasize the, the essay on, or the talk on marriage, which a lot of people have read and really profited from. I think it's a combination of things. I mean, everybody has a mother and a father, and everybody, or mostly everybody, grew up in some kind of a family, so that someone should have insights, that, that an unmarried person should have insights into a marital relationship shouldn't be too surprising. Right? I think the other side of it is that uh, in addition to the elder's natural intelligence, which he cultivated through education and reading, that he had the grace of the Holy Spirit that was able to build on his own natural intelligence, and which he himself had cultivated. Mm -hmm. right? Fried Maximus the Confessor says that God will not give wisdom to a person who, is, who has no love of knowledge. And God will not give, the Holy Spirit will not give the gift of healing to someone who doesn't love his fellow man. Mm. So God takes, the Holy Spirit takes our natural gifts and builds on them. And I think the elder was just this sort of very, very intelligent and very, very insightful person whose natural gifts of insight and discernment and knowledge were really just enriched and expanded and magnified by the grace of the Holy Spirit. This is why all the saints are able to be the teachers that they are, not simply on the basis of their own intelligence, which mm -hmm. most of them had, I mean, the ones who wrote, um, but uh, b because of the gift of the Spirit. It's, it's also maybe an implicit 
correction to this idea that we have in our culture today that if I'm not your race or your gender or your whatever it might be, I'm somehow incapable of understanding yes. anything at all about you, yes. which I think is ex a little extreme. I think we have a lot more in common as human beings than we do in terms of what divides us. Yes, I agree. I agree. I, I find Elder Emil Anos as an answer, especially in, in his article on marriage, The Great Sacrament, as an answer to those who think, well, how can a monk or a church father who was celibate speak to me about the married state? I, I've, I have uh, often answered that by pointing out that, <clears throat> as you did, that they had families in which they grew up, they witnessed marriage. St. John Chrysostom, for instance, had his most beautiful mother and saw how tender it was, but also the emphasis that they were in the archetypal marriage the mystical marriage themselves and were able to apply f from their own uh, deep interaction with God uh, in this love relationship with him the things that are most important to see in the earthly perspective of marriage. I find Father Emiliano is just inspiring and I hope that if uh, those who are watching this interview haven't read his article on marriage that, that they will. Would you end, Father, by suggesting um, some of his works to our, our watchers? How, if someone wanted to go buy a book today and get to know Father Emilianos, <clears throat> learn about his life and about his, how should they proceed? Well, in uh, 2014, the uh, periodical The Orthodox Word devoted an entire issue to the life of Elder Emilianos. Mm -hmm. And that remains uh, the most complete sort of biography of the elder uh, in English. It would be great one day if we had a full-scale biography, but until that happens, there is this very nice issue yes. of the Orthodox Word 2014. In terms of uh, reading the elder's writings, we have about, I think, four books so far in English. The Authentic Seal, The Church at Prayer, Psalms and the Life of Faith, and The Mystical Marriage. I think the best place to start to really come to, to begin to sort of get used to the elder's voice and to the way he thinks and the way he is, teaches would be either the book on the Psalms, which I understand is a very popular book, many people have read it, and the newer book on mystical marriage I think is also a very good place to start because it's a very cohesive work and it does provide a very solid introduction to really basic points of orthodox uh, spirituality. Um, all the other books are good too, but uh, they tend to have, they don't, they're collections of talks on different subjects, so they don't have quite the same cohesiveness as the book on the Psalms or the mystical marriage. So I, I think those would be better places to uh, start with. And would you share what, <clears throat> which of those books were you the translator for? Uh, all of them, I think. And did you find it difficult, Father, to translate Elder Emilianos? How does he compare to translating St. Maximus? Well, this, this, it's really apples and oranges, but no, I mean, there was, I, wouldn't, I would never, it was never difficult. It was always just a tremendous joy and a blessing to be able to spend my time in the company of his uh, thought. And it was just, it's always been striking to me that, I mean, even though I've translated four books so far, it's never gotten old, he doesn't repeat himself, and there's essentially a revelation on every page. I mean, I'm just struck time and again by what the elder was able to generate uh, from his experience of God and how he had the gift of articulating that in simple and yet very, very sort of penetrating kind of uh, language. I think God who loves us so much as to give us a love gift like Father Emilianos, how, mu how much he loves us. And I thank God also for your work, Father. I'm very selfish, and I know I speak for many people who have benefited in their souls from all your labors. <clears throat> and I ask God to please keep you in good health of body and soul for many years to come so that your work on behalf of the church and for the advancement of our Savior's gospel continues. 
Thank you, and I should say that <clears throat> who I am and what I am and what I'm able to do is something that I owe entirely to Elder Eliseos of Simanopatra and the Brotherhood of the Monastery who, in their way, brought me to birth in Christ and initiated me into the mystery of the Church, so I can only be grateful to them for their presence in my life. Thank you for this interview. We ask your prayers, Father. And I yours. Thank you. Thank you.